So, Professor Tudor, welcome. Yeah. Good. Um, you know, so in some ways, today's conversation is about what happened on January 6th of 2021. Uh, but in but in most in many ways it's actually not about the details of a of a you know a big public event near the White House or on the White House and then heading down that mile and a half to the those details are yes kind of important but I'm not sure they're important as many other details um, so we're going to see how many of those details we've figured out in the last year and the answer is there's a lot of people studying this so we'll, there'll be more details coming out. Uh, but what I'm mostly interested in is the long-term perspective of a, how a historian would view the events that I took two days off at work. I watched it live, and I was chatting with congressional staff members, and the next day I took off, and I was trying to understand what I saw. Well, cool. I'm probably one of millions of Americans that took some time off to watch what happened a year and a week ago. Uh, but I'm most interested in is are there differences on how a historian would look at those events into how a layman, me, would look at those events and, and, and add some context or some substance to the way we should think through patriotism and citizenship and the role of individual versus government. I think we should take a couple minutes to talk about that. So I have five or six questions for you. Ready? Yep. What is our national purpose? To secure rights. Is that every government's national purpose? Uh, there's 185 countries, however many there are. Is that their national purpose? What is no, our no. national purpose? The uh, national purpose of the United States, the United States of America is unique among nations historically, uh, although there are countries who are like this now, that, that we were founded as an ideological nation state. And that means that we are the ideas people government, uh, that the, the, who the people are is defined by ideas and who the government is, is defined by the people. And the uh, so uh, the people, the government and the ideas can't be separated. We were founded as a group of people who all believe in the same stuff in terms of, not in terms of how to live your life, but in terms of what our social relationships should be. And that and means that- and, and I, I always tell my students that the, um, the important thing is that uh, the word S in rights uh, to indicate that in the United States, we believe in pluralism, which means that the purpose of government is to negotiate peacefully between rights that you already have, rights plural, and thus our rights are always going to be in conflict with one another, and we all have to be dedicated to the peaceful negotiation of these rights, these multiple rights that Americans have. So in 1776, when we rebelled against the king and then later Articles of uh, Confederation and then enshrined in the Constitution in 1789, uh, that was unique in world history at the time. Yes. And a new order uh, for the ages. Yeah. And for some reason, we forget that or we argue about that, but that's not the purpose of today's show. But for some reason, that's kind of in controversy. Today, well, you know, uh, 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 you know, a fish is never uh, aware that you're swimming, you know, in a way, because we've lived so long in this society, we, we tend to forget what is unique about it, because it's what we grow up with. It's what we think of as normal. Okay, great. Um, second question. What is the meaning and importance of the US Constitution? The, the meaning and importance is that the uh, as uh, as this was settled in courts and in the Civil War, uh, the purpose of the Constitution is to enact the ideals of the Declaration. That the proper way to view the Constitution is uh, that the Constitution is a thing that exists in order to preserve and protect and defend the ideals of the Declaration. And the main, I mean, there's several, but besides a litany of things that we're mad about, about the king, uh, the main importance of the Declaration of Independence enshrined in the Constitution is what? Maybe one, two, three, but really yeah. there's one big oh, one. Yeah. The ideal that, that all human beings are uh, created of equal station and entitled to practice the plural rights that they have. And among these rights are the right to live, the right to pursue a life of your own choosing and um, the uh, right to um, uh, be left alone <laughs> if you are not bothering anyone else. 
Uh, great, great. And, and I know this is a, a big historical context to what happened a year ago, but I think it's important. Third question, what is patriotism in the American sense? Patriotism in the American sense means adhering to the ideals of the Declaration. So you cannot claim to be patriotic and be acting contrary to uh, how the Constitution enacts the ideals of the Declaration. So the definition of patriotism is, uh, do you preserve, I mean, it's the only oath that <laughs> many, federal, many people ever take is the oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. And the reason we do that is because the Constitution protects the ideals of the Declaration. It's important to pause for a second, and, and, and you and I differ just slightly on this, I think. You're probably right. Um, political science degree and a law degree, and I've been doing politics for professionally for a long time, but you're still probably right. Uh, you said Declaration of Independence first, then Constitution, then we're sworn to uphold the Constitution. We're not sworn to uphold the ability of the citizen to overthrow their government, as we did in the Declaration of Independence. Should we be so aggrieved by what government's doing that we have the ability to overthrow our government. We don't swear to that. So just to tell the difference between that revolutionary document versus the rule of law document. Well, because um, you swear allegiance to the system because, because the system enacts the ideals, but it's also because every individual is not, doesn't get to be judge, jury, and executioner in uh, their own trial. Um, you don't get to roll out of bed and say, well, I think this is my right to liberty, so therefore it trumps um, your right to a fair trial, for instance. So we swear allegiance to the system because that system protects the ideals. Is that, is that what you were driving at? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, 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 mine's a little bit more layman's terms that the, the Constitution is a rule of law document. We can actually look to see what the letter of the law is where the Declaration of Independence is a list of grievances that are so draconian that we've got to shed the monarchy. Right. So they are different types of documents. Yes, absolutely. But, you know, it's kind of one of those things where you say, well, it, it, it's this, there's this debate, you know, between constitutional scholars, or be, between like textualists and originalists. Mm -hmm. And I always found that to be almost a false choice because in a way, yes, you have the text, but then you have to figure out what the text means. Uh -huh. And uh, and so, uh, you know, Lincoln's understanding of it, it is the way that um, um, the, the law came to understand this relationship in the North, uh, um, that um, if you want to know what the Constitution means, you look at the Declaration. And then uh, to the logical uh, conclusion, you look at that. You adhere to the text. Yes, but but if you if the text is ambiguous or you don't know what it means, it, you look to the Declaration because it, with the with the understanding that the purpose of the Constitution is to enact the Declaration, so it is uh, it, it's the answer key, I guess, to the uh, to the Constitution. For a time, for a different topic, but then you also look at the Bill of Rights and you look at all the amendments since then. And then you look at Supreme Court decisions from Marbury versus Madison today. And then all of a sudden you get the fuller picture of what the rule of law is. Yep. Correct. Okay, cool. What a uh, fourth question. What is a conservative and what is the purpose of a conservative? Uh, an American conservative. Is Thank someone, you. American conservative. Yeah, American conservative is someone who is committed to that system we just described. It's, it's, it's really that simple, isn't it? We don't have to go through a long thing, whether it's guns or abortion or gays or, I mean, all the stuff that we currently argue about. Say that again. What is an American conservative and what is the purpose of being a conservative? Uh, the, the definition of an American conservative is someone who uh, adheres to Lincoln's understanding of uh, the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. So, and you fight and, for that. That's the principle that you fight for. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, a couple, uh, this is, sounds like I'm taking a, a, a detour. I'm not. Um, I want to jump into your profession real quick for a second. What is reality? What is a fact? And what is history? How do we know? It seems like we're, we saw the same thing on TV a year ago, and we come to different conclusions. How do we as human beings, American human beings, figure out what is reality? What is a fact? What is history? 
from a historian's perspective? Well, it's, uh, I guess, I, I, let me describe the ideal. <laughs> and then with, and in all these answers, I'm describing the ideal, understanding that the reality was different. But um, I, you know, I, class started last week. So I, I went through all this with my students last week. But I said, what historians really do is different than how most people are taught to understand information now. Um, and so I understand that for their entire lives, they are taught that you, you have a feeling or an assertion, or a pro and a con, and then you go out and look for evidence. And then you think that you're being unbiased when you uh, do like a pro search and a con search based on, you know, or a for and an against. And then you say, well, now I'm being even handed. And I, I just say that's the opposite of how I was taught to be a historian. What historians and so, do, Professor, uh, just so I understand, uh, basically, that's how lawyers operate, right? That's kind of my legal training. You yeah. ask questions and you develop a hypothesis and you find the facts and you make your best argument. Yeah, because lawyers have clients. In other words, the way that a lawyer or an advocate is supposed to make their case is let's go and find facts that prove that we're right. Uh, what a historian is supposed to do is uh, you start with a bunch of facts, you start with data, you start with sources. And I tell my students, all we do is we take all these sources, we summarize them and make them shorter. <laughs> we, what, what, and turn it into a story. So we take a lot of information, we make it shorter and turn it into a story. That's what a historian does. And because what we'll often find is that if you look at the facts first and summarize it and turn it into a story, what you'll find is that uh, it answers questions that you didn't think you had. <laughs> and it's, uh, and it, it will also tell, doing that will also tell you that what the questions that you had arbitrarily propped up were in fact all the wrong questions. Lee, and and uh, that and in fact the question the answer uh, to the question you ask is that's an impossible question because you're misunderstanding the context of everything that happened. <laughs> so uh, and and people find this deeply unsatisfying because everyone you know you your brain tells you I want to win this argument or I want the truth I want to just know yeah. the fact. But, but the truth is unsatisfying, because if you're a historian, you, you sometimes have to say things like, well, now we don't know. And, yeah. and, and then people get into this, uh, isn't it possible that? And I always have to tell my students like, yeah, we don't do that. <laughs> we, uh, we, we, you could spend your entire life trying to track down, isn't it possible that? And, um, you know, there are at least... Uh, verbal shortcuts you always get. And isn't it possible that's one of them? Yeah, but still is another one. Yeah, you know, like this is the, uh, I know you've just told me that we've been asking the wrong questions and that and that there's no answer to this question. Yeah, but still, right? Or isn't it possible that? And like, yeah, okay, well, if, if what you want is a lawyer, go hire one. But I'm here to tell you what the evidence we have means in context. Okay, and we're getting closer to the subject at hand of the peaceful transition of power, more than January 6th itself, but it's all related. Uh, first, uh, you should give your bona fides uh, before you answer this question. Um, and that is, what are the core values of the GOP, the Republican Party? And I'll, I'll even tell you that in, in Facebook posts of the last year, you wrote two different posts that I could find, freedom, opportunity, equality, representative government. But you can change your answer now. What are the core values of the Republican Party today? Uh, what I can tell you what they were are supposed to be. And <laughs> what I'm are the core values of the Republican Party? Yeah. However, you choose to answer it. Yeah, um, liberty from 1856. From the 1850s, when the first Americans were putting together the ideas that came together as the Republican Party, up until 2016. It was liberty, opportunity, and American exceptionalism. Uh, defining liberty as freedom of the individual uh, and the protection of individual rights, 
believing that uh, government uh, should be the vehicle and can be the vehicle for opportunity and economic opportunity. And then American exceptionalism, meaning um, the protection of, again, again, I always have to correct this because I know that people think American exceptionalism means America is better than everyone else. That's not what it, <laughs> so we have to stop and say American exceptionalism properly understood, which is American exceptionalism is the idea that the first responsibility of the United States government is to preserve representative government in order to serve as an example for the rest of the world that human beings can govern themselves. Wonderful. Uh, we're almost to the task at hand. In fact, oh, you need to give your uh, Republican bona fides. I was a uh, bona fides. I, I was a Republican. Uh, yeah, I was, uh, right. You still are? I am still a registered Republican. Um, okay. uh, I still hold out hope that uh, Republicans will find their way back to what they believed for 150 years. Um, and uh, um, I have campaigned for every Republican candidate since I was in junior high, I, uh, except for President Trump. Um, and uh, I was the um, uh, vice chair of the Republican Party in my county for about 10 years. Um, and it was, um, and, and that was when my three congressmen in my county were uh, <laughs> Kevin McCarthy, Devin Nunes, and David Valadeo. You've been living a lifetime of Republican politics, teaching history, American yeah. history, but then living a private citizen's life of a Republican activist. Yes, uh, I founded uh, the chapter of the Log Cabin Republicans. I was the advisor for the college Republicans for over a decade. I uh, uh, you know, it attended Republican conventions as a delegate, uh, state conventions, not the national convention. Um, you know, I did all of the things that you would expect someone who was a Republican Party official to do uh, from, you know, 2007 until 2016. Cool. And mine is from 1984 to 2016 when I resigned the party um, and have remained a non-Republican since then. Um, you and I, though, don't hate each other though, right? I think the Republican Party has gone way off the deep end for the last five years and you may agree or disagree, but the bottom line is you're still in the party. Do we hate each other? No, I, no we do not. Okay. Um, it's left in your home. <laughs> thank you for visiting Colorado and you're always happy to be a guest in my home. We are honored to have you here. And same uh, here. You need to come to California at some point. I'm delighted to go there. Thanks for the invitation. Frankie's got a pool. We can all stay there. Uh, yeah, you too, Tony, know, but we've already talked about it. You know, yeah. you, Bring them all. Um, so, uh, Professor, uh, the reason I bring that up now before we go into the heart of the matter is that many of our friends, um, hate may not be too strong of a word. They truly hate each other over the last five years of what's going on in America. And, and it's not just liberals against conservatives and vice versa. It's conservatives against conservatives and moderate Democrats against liberals. And I mean, it's just, there's a lot of hatred going on out there. Do you have any context for us as a historian? I mean, there was a civil war that you studied extensively. Are we there yet? Do we have to hate each other? Or is there another way to have a conversation? You know, I think it's for me, one of the, the I've been spending a lot of time reading, um, it's funny, former slaves and black intellectuals from the late 19th century, because they, they really, for me, have always provided the um, the most powerful arguments for why you should not be a, a reactionary. Um, so if you think about people who were deprived of their freedom and who should have uh, every reason to mm -hmm. define themselves in opposition to the people who uh, held them as slaves, um, but they were so um, adamant. I mean, in a way, I think they understood it better than, than anybody else how important it was to retain your own individual autonomy and define yourself and not let your opponents define you. Um, and, and in that way, make sure that you do not become a reactionary. In other words, when you're a reactionary, you are saying, whatever my opponent says, I'm the opposite. <laughs> and when you do that, it's kind of like that old Bugs Bunny cartoon where rabbit season and they're arguing over rabbit season versus duck season. 
right? As soon as one person says wabbit season, you say duck season, right? And, and, but then what you're actually doing is you're giving to that other person control over your beliefs. So what you have to guard is you have to guard your own autonomy and your own examination in order to make sure that you're not giving over to someone else the power over your belief system. And in that sense, I think it's important for me to say that just because I am uh, called names or hatred is directed at me, that doesn't mean that I must let their hatred define me. And in fact, I need to be even more careful and make sure that how other people, uh, <laughs> the, that my the people who don't have my best interests at heart, <laughs> don't get to define who I am. Um, you, you don't get to tell me who I am. You don't get to say, oh, because you are this, you are therefore that. I retain control over my own identity. Um, Love so, that. I, I think it's helpful advice for us because too many of us just seem to be emotionally driven humans in this and, and just spew out stuff whether we mean it or not. And I, and I think you and I have a role in helping people think through this from a historical perspective. Maybe that's arrogant. I don't know. Is that arrogant that we should help? Well, I always liked, you know, Jonah Goldberg, I don't know if this idea was um, unique with him, but he would describe conservatism as a partial philosophy of life. Meaning that it, 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 if you draw, you, you draw your sense of self-worth from many areas of your life, you know, if you want to know who I am as a person, um, you ask my children, ask my friends, ask my family, ask, you know, you have your church life, your civic life, your life with your neighbors, and it's only in the absence of all having all of those other things that you would let someone else try to tell you who you are as a person. So uh, it, it's really important to not let politics uh, overwhelm your identity and to retain parts of you that are not defined by politics. Love that. Love that. Uh, we have now gone 23 minutes into a 30 minute conversation on the peaceful transition of power. And I admit some people may critique my interview style and say, what the hell are you talking about, John? But let's get to the let's get to the heart of the matter. If you want a current uh, at the time um, reflection, we this is our second show on this. We already did one on February 19th on the impeachment and what the GOP is, should be, was doing and should be doing. So if anyone really wants to know what we were thinking about just a couple of weeks after, um, well, they can just get on the interweb and find that out. So today I'm gonna to explore, we're gonna explore a little bit more um, about what you said then and whether you still believe it now and whether it's gotten worse or better. So this is gonna sound kind of harsh. And by the way, I am intentionally and partially because of Arthur Brooks, I want to keep the, the, the and, and it's a story and you may correct me, but I want to keep the audience or the, the focus of my angst to be as small of a group as possible. And maybe that's just the former president and Steve Bannon, or, 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 but there's more, maybe there's some congressmen and senators and then some activists and, and some weird guy in a hat who had tattoos. I'm, you know, there, but I want to keep, it's not the Republican party. It's, it's not everybody that voted for President Trump. I, I just think that's really unhealthy in our society to have this anger towards 40 to 45% of the population. Am I right or wrong? You're absolutely right. I agree uh, 100%. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, here are your words. Ready? Yep. January 5th. It's still on the interweb. It's a public post, by the way. It's not a private post. Um, Donald Trump, the lifelong Democrat and liberal and his supporters who pledged to destroy the Republican Party has made every effort to rule as a monarch. Another post, Don, or later on in the same long post, Dave, Donald Trump and his supporters hate the Constitution and the limits it places on the power and ambitions. They want a king, and they will destroy it if you allow it. I think the last, I'm not sure the last three words. Donald Trump has broken his oath of office many times. 
and then I'll pause and kind of get a reaction. That's what you thought the day before the insurrection. This isn't January 6th, this was January 5th. You had some real frustration with what was going on on the peaceful transition of power. So talk to us about that. Do you still stand by those words? Do you enhance them or do you retract them? Do you give some nuance? Talk to us about what we as citizens should be thinking about what happened a year and a week ago. Well, I, I would, yeah, I would say that if anything, his conduct has demonstrated that what I said before even the stuff that happened on January, like one of the things that, you know, uh, a, a thing that conservative intellectuals often say is that character is destiny. And so you shouldn't be surprised when Donald Trump acts like Donald Trump um, and uh, his, um, his conduct while in office, his conduct while campaigning, his conduct after uh, losing the election, his conduct on January 6th, his conduct ever since then has remained remarkably consistent. And yet, in terms 40, of his character. And yet 45% of our fellow citizens still apparently support him and there's all the political wags are saying there's a legitimate chance if he's alive and decides to run they might have a chance to win again um right yes so what does that mean about our country going back to the context of our national purpose our MP importance of the constitution what it means to be a patriot what it means to be a conservative what it means to be a republican where the heck are we in america a year later well how is this happening well, and this, I think, gets back to how uh, I understand and agree on when when people make their I am a conservative and a Republican, and I believe that uh, what Joe Biden and what Democrats advocate for openly is a cancer on uh, the American experiment and will eventually lead to the destruction of the United States of America. Um, what Donald Trump represents is a heart attack and an attack on the United States. So when my friends were trying to assess what's the bigger threat to the United States of America, and many of them thought that the cancer was more deadly than the heart attack, um, I, I did not have the same conclusion, but I understand. <laughs> so I would just, you know, so much of this seems like it's focused on attacks on, on President Trump because of what he did. And I've always been pretty clear about that, but I, I don't, <laughs> but I, I, I would also add that um, the um, destruction of the United States by leftists is no more preferable. It's just something long-term rather than a direct attack. So, so we can live to fight another day on that battle. Yeah, exactly. And, and, but, that, but, but I have a hard time morally condemning someone from saying, uh, and this tends to be how most, I would say, mainstream Republicans tended to view this, so if you talk, if you get a little bit past the rhetoric and the, and the automatic knee-jerk mm -hmm. defense of Trump, Republicans then 100% of the time go, but look, enough is enough. It, you know, it, 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 we had, it, and they'll go straight to the Supreme Court and say, you know what, it doesn't matter. What we learned over the previous 50 years is that liberals would destroy America by simply, you know, reinterpreting the Constitution to mean whatever they said, wanted it to mean, and that enough is enough, and we needed to, uh, and it's a, they'll uh, say it's a binary choice, it's one or the other, and I decided that what was more important was the fact that uh, President Trump promised even though he's not a conservative and not a Republican, really, uh, you know, he promised to select judges and justices from this list. <laughs> and, and during his four years in office, he kept that promise. Uh, and that um, that is more important than, um, you know, rolling the dice. And the other thing that people will say- That's what many of our friends are saying. This is the argument you're saying, yeah. many of our friends are saying, and you understand. And the other piece of it is that they'll often say, 
Yes, but Democrats changed the rules on voting in many states because of the pandemic and therefore the election is somehow illegitimate. And I would just argue like, well, it doesn't really, first of all, it's not how elections work. You don't, you don't complain about um, <laughs> the rules of the election just in the places where you lost narrowly after the election. I found it really strange that all of these Trump supporters were essentially making the arguments that Al Gore supporters made in Florida in 2000, because it was the Democrats in 2000 who were saying, let's just keep recounting the votes and play in counties where we think we're gonna win uh, and, and, and until Al Gore wins. Uh, it, and, and Republicans in 2000 understood like, well, that's not fair, <laughs> you know, like you, that seems absurd. We're just going to recount the votes just in the areas where we think we can pick up votes and we're going to keep doing it forever until Al Gore wins the election. Like that would be changing the rules and changing the rules on counting after the election has taken place. And um, again, I, I, I always, I would, I find it, you know, it's one of the better instances of hypocrisy that, uh, you know, the same people who, <laughs> that, that, that are, you know, the, the sides just sort of were making the opposite argument. Um, and, and conservatives shouldn't be playing that game, correct? Right. And again, I'm not a reactionary. So people said, well, now the Democrats are making the case that we need to, <laughs> to keep the rules. And my position is uh, good. <laughs> <laughs> they should be making the argument that uh, the rules need to be the same. And uh, yeah, I don't, I don't switch and start saying wabbit season just because the other side is saying duck season. Yeah. Uh, I say, thank you for agreeing with me. You, will you now admit that you were wrong in 2000? <laughs> Tony, did you have your hand up? Okay. You were just swatting a fly in, in January in Colorado. Okay. I get you. Uh, the professor. Um, here's the big question. It goes to the whole transition of power. You said this the day before, uh, January 6th, after uh, the states had all submitted their uh, votes to Congress. They had already taken that. Uh, that was already in December. And you said this on January 5th, quote, the president of the Senate, this is the Constitution quote, this isn't your quote, the president of the Senate shall in the present presence of the Senate and House of Representatives open all the certificates and the votes shall be counted, end quote, U.S. Constitution. Your quote now, following directly after that. Oh, wait, your audio cut out. Can you reset? And now you're frozen. I hope that whatever I said, okay, now try. Can you hear me now? can hear you, but you're, you're uh, okay. Start yeah. over with just my quote. <laughs> Your quote, anyone, and which is why I went through this big context for us to put it in perspective. Anyone who doesn't support that premise has no honor, does not care about their oaths, and has no right to call themselves a conservative or patriotic or Republican. You're pit, unquote. You're pissed on January 5th. So are you still pissed? Are you still, do you stand by that quote? You said anyone that does not support that premise. I don't see it as even um, an expression of anger. I just see it as what is. <laughs> I, 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 it's, you know, one of the things we spend time on in uh, is, um, People think that something is either a fact or an opinion. And I have to explain to my students what a thesis is. And a thesis is not a fact and it's not an opinion. It is the conclusion you must draw from the evidence. And when I say that, um, you know, what I said in that post, um, it is a conclusion that I drew from the facts. So um, do you go with my narrow definition that it's president, former president, close advisors, active supporters, people that invaded the Capitol in the insurrection, maybe people that sponsored it, those are the people? Or is it everybody that's a Republican or a conservative or voted for Trump the first time or the second time? Who, where do those facts lead? 
Okay, let me give you, a, let me be as precise as I can, right? If there's one of those people who said, who said that Mike Pence could decide which votes to count, who then in the next election doesn't make the argument that Kamala Harris can single-handedly choose the next president, that's who I'm talking about. Okay. So professor, can you hear me? Yes. What, those are my questions. The interview's done. It's, we're 36 minutes into it. <laughs> Yeah. And I'm happy to hear from Frank or Bart or Tony, um, but, but, but really I'm kind of missing the main point. And I'm doing this intentionally because I want you to think back now from the time you started being a young man to being interested in history, to being a citizen and being active in politics. What should we, the last big question for me is what should we really be thinking about this? I mean, I have lost friends on the left and the right. My conservative friends are mad at me that I'm just not supporting the president, former president. They have been for five years. My liberal friends are mad at me that I'm not just blasting away at the president every single day because I do have an audience. I do have a sphere of influence. And, and they think this is the most important thing in the history of the world. And I can't be talking about my runs or my family or my hobbies. I need to be blasting away until this evil is excess, this cancer or a heart attack is cured. I, I've got to be against the president every waking moment. I, I've got Everybody's mad at me. And who cares about anyone being mad at me? What is your historian approach to how we should think about last year and what's going on now with the investigation, what's going on with the Department of Justice? Um, give us your big picture from a historian's perspective. What should we be thinking about? Well, the big picture should always refer back to, I guess, what Hamilton said in Federalist One. And why this makes me so depressed uh, in a way. Um, I tr try not to be this way, but it's really, it's been really hard over the last five or six years not to think that like, you know, I've been toiling away at this enterprise and nobody cares. <laughs> you know, I'm doing everything I can to, to try to um, um, preserve uh, what is the source of peace and happiness and prosperity for human beings and human thriving and the greatest um, source of peace, prosperity and thriving in all of human history. And that is what Hamilton says, we're here to decide the important question, right? Which is, can human beings govern themselves? And we have a tremendous cultural problem in the United States in that the people who control our institutions um, have stopped teaching the fundamentals of the American system of government. Um, in other words, we're so focused on teaching outside the box that we've completely forgotten what the box is. And basic civic education, what, what, what people come away with knowing is either um, wrong uh, or simply absent. There, uh, the, and this has created this tremendous uh, vacuum in our society. And in the absence of knowing how our system is supposed to work, human beings resort to tribalism. They resort to uh, the politics of emotion. In other words, if you don't give someone reason and history, they will resort to what human beings resort to when they don't have reason and history. They resort to using their feelings and wanting politics to be an expression of their feelings. But professor, on that very specific point, your last sentence or two sentences, isn't that the history of the human race? Isn't that every relationship between citizens and whatever government it's been? Uh, except I guess with the nuance that some powerful person just tells everybody else what they're gonna do. And if they don't like it, they kill them, but. Yes, it, until the founding of the United States. Right. I mean, so do we really want what we say we want? We want power. We want to make sure we 
do we really want that? I mean, that's the whole written history of, the hu of the humans. Yeah, and that's why I don't understand, you know, the, the uh, on the left and the right, mm -hmm. what they both want is tyranny and violence. They both want the uh, the ability to oppress people who disagree with them. But I want to ask you though, because I, I've been heavily critiqued, and that's okay. I like critiques actually in private, especially, but um, uh, people tell me that you're engaged in what about ism? We're talking about the peaceful transition of power and what happened to insurrection at the Capitol. And you're going, yeah, but Democrats are bad too. They, they advocate violence. Black lives matter. Look at all the, you don't mess You don't mean that, right? You're talking about a, a bigger picture context, or maybe you do mean it. What, what, talk to us about that. What about ism? Well, to me, the target of my uh, you know, the target of my ire, the target of, you know, the biggest threat to human human beings, the biggest threat in human history, they all derive from some form of totalitarianism. And so to me, um, I'm not referring to what about -ism. I'm simply pointing out that I'm opposed to totalitarianism in all of its forms. I am opposed to any form of philosophical monism. I am a supporter of po of political pluralism, uh, and I support I, I support uh, you know the protection of your many rights, uh, not just simply the ones that I like. Uh, yeah. And okay. That's a nice that's a nice healthy discussion. We only have a couple friends on the call today, which is great because they're reliable, thoughtful friends. Um, I, as I said, I'd go 30 to 45 minutes. We've gone 42 minutes. Um, I now open it up. Uh, professor has a, a hard stop at about 12 or 12, 5, 12, 15. Uh, I know that's not a hard stop, but it's a fuzzy hard stop. Um, and so Frank, you've taken yourself off mute. Now's your time to do a better interview than I did with Professor Tootle. Go never, ahead. Never impossible. <laughs> I appreciate all the, the form we take. So, um, it's the far left and the far right that are driving these divergent, the, the, where we're not focusing on the importance of political pluralism. That's what cent, the, the center Americans want is pluralism. Yes. How do we get our political leaders to migrate away from the the, the extremes of the folks in their the sphere their spheres of influence and try to keep it a narrow answer for that because we've already done a, a a whole conversation on elections and extremism there's a bunch of stuff in there frank so try to keep it in the context of peaceful transition of power but but go ahead professor and then you can ask a follow-up frank uh i mean run for local office Go to your local um, school board yeah. and uh, find out if they who's teaching civics. Ask to see the civics textbook. Look at the curriculum from your state and your county, um, and do that. Even if you don't have kids in school. Okay. okay. Very well stated. Excellent. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. And I don't know why we all are bent out of shape of what's going on thousands of miles away from us. I mean, I, I guess it's of interest, but we really should do stuff where we have like huge, huge insights as local citizens and also responsibilities and privileges to actually do exactly what you just said. Yeah, I mean, the, the largest educational entity in the United States is the California Community College System. And the, um, uh, the California Academic Senate exists in order to protect the academic freedom of professors within that system. And their stated position is that we need to get rid, rid of merit-based hiring. Hmm. <laughs> I, I, you know, and I think if the average person in California knew what was in some of these guidance uh, uh, documents, they would be outraged and say you, you don't want the best scientist or the best historian or the best mathematician and the best that knows how people think so in order to transfer that knowledge you don't want the best yeah okay all right well 
Okay, wow. But I, but I mean, there, there are these examples that exist. I, I, I just know that if anybody who watches this spends, you know, a day, you know, set aside one day of your life in the next year to, um, to engage with uh, whatever is being taught at your local, uh, I mean, I say this, you know, I have two kids who are in school and they have a dad who is a history professor who does this YouTube channel. And I can tell you that my kids, what they know about history, you know, go going through the seventh and eighth grade is just basically that America is bad. And that's about it. <laughs> Well, and Professor, we'd like to do that day, but we're busy reading real history books written by historians in full. <laughs> that was just another piece of your advice. But yes, we'll get to that after we read a bunch of history books. Uh, Bart, you're up. Um, professor, you know, uh, I guess I play the role of the optimist in these conversations. Yes. And um, I really think the transfer of power, uh, peaceful transfer of power, is a hallmark of our country. Without that, we're kind of like any other country that's out there. Um, we don't have the problems that they've had in Mexico, for example, where you've had revolutions that have gone on for like practically a century. You know, they're not going on right now, but you might argue maybe they are. I don't know. Um, what I'm getting at is how, how can we impress upon people the level of importance that the peaceful transfer of power actually has in our country and our culture. And I know it's through history, but there's also got to be something else because I think people are losing sight of the value of this. Agreed. That's no, a great I, question, Bart. And I would say that, you know, Americans by their actions uh, protect the rights of others every day. And I, uh, I would always just simply say to preach what you practice, <laughs> right? You all, every one of us, if you go outside and talk to your friends and your neighbors and you, the most rabid uh, left-wing AOC supporting whatever, uh, um, uh, or your most rabid Trump supporting friend, um, and what you will find is that in their daily life, they protect the, the rights of the people around them to speak. They protect the right, their property rights. They protect their political rights. And all I would want them to do is to preach what they already practice. Hmm. Recognize that the, the culture is still in us. <laughs> we just have to mate the understand that that culture came from somewhere and continue to teach where that culture comes from. Because the, the loss of institutions, it leads to this sort of, it, you know, what we're feeling, I, I think, almost comes down to a disconnect. You know, like the rest of the world is crazy, but my world is not. How does this make sense? It seems so disconnected with reality. And it's because the institutions of government are no longer reflecting the, the actual political culture of the United States that's still here. It's still in us. It's still in our DNA. So, Professor, let me uh, do a follow-up to Bart's question to see if I'm listening correctly. Uh, I'm older than you are, but when I grew up in the 70s and 80s as a young person, um, there was, you know, three channels of nightly news, and we watched it for a half an hour. And after listening to those three anchors for a half an hour, and part of it was feel good and part of it was detail stuff, you know, there's only like you know, five or 10 minutes of news. I don't know, we went on with our lives and I had no idea what my parents thought and my next door neighbor thought and my minister thought and my girlfriend thought. And I, I don't know, we just played soccer and we hung out and we mowed the lawn and we just did stuff. And now we have this every single 330 million Americans plus 7 billion people have all become instant reporters, columnists, ministers, history professors, scientists, and we're all just spouting out stuff all day long. And then that irritates each one of us because we all have little tiny slivers of expertise. And we go, oh, that's wrong. And so we argue with them. And, and, and maybe we just haven't figured out this communication ability. I mean, if we wanted to throw a party in the 80s, we'd hang a thing on a telephone pole or hand out flyers at school, you know, it was hard. 
And we got it together somehow, but we didn't know what we were missing. We just knew that there was a kegger on, you know, first and main. Um, talk to us about Bart's question about how we get rid of that disconnect as humans. Well, you know, uh, I guess I'm, I had two thoughts. Number one is, as a historian, I have to always be open to the idea of an accident or luck. And that we are, in fact, over-interpreting something that is really best explained as just something that's an accident or luck. I am still entirely open to the idea that Trump just got lucky. <laughs> that, uh, and that maybe it doesn't mean any of the things that we, are, <laughs> that we think it means. And we're, putting, we're investing far too much meaning in what was essentially just somebody getting lucky. Uh, so I'll set that on a I'll set that aside. You know, with all due humility, we should at least have some corner of our brain where we're open to the idea that maybe he just got lucky, and that this doesn't mean any of the things that we think it means. But um, in terms of our uh, what social media did um, to our uh, relationships, it also allowed us to uh, encounter the abstract versions of mm. our friends and family's belief systems um, in ways that we'd never seen before. And the worst aspects of our uh, personalities were sometimes put on display as, uh, as being permanent. You know, every, uh, and I think about it in, in these terms when I'm, if you think about who you are as a person, are you actually, you know, are you the worst thing that you have ever thought? <laughs> are you the worst thing you've ever, that you is, if you think that the, the, ver, the, the version of you, the real you is the worst permanent, the worst version of you is that permanent. And what social media does in many cases is it makes the worst version of you permanent, <laughs> you know, uh, and, um, uh, you know, the you that's like, oh, I'm angry and it's 1130 at night and I've had three drinks and, you know, these blah, blah, blahs or whatever, like, and the next morning, if you were healthy and you'd gone, just gone on a walk and had been holding hands with your grandkids, you, you would have, uh, what you would have written instead is like, the world's an okay place and we should be nice to each other, you know, and you're the, still the same person, right? The same person is capable of both of those things. So, uh, and it also, we have always co coexisted with people who hold wacky beliefs. <laughs> always. We just didn't know about it. I mean, I didn't know, you know, uh, how my friends and family felt about every single thing that had ever happened and how they thought the world worked and all of that. You know, when I was first getting started as a historian and as a, you know, someone who writes things that other people read or whatever. Um, I, that was my training, <laughs> you know, like, I, and I understood, uh, oh, I'm writing this. Um, and this was maybe one of the big wake up moments uh, of, of graduate school was when I finally understood that what I was writing represented me and wasn't something I was just doing for that professor on this paper that no, that, 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 that like, oh, I'm putting my name on it. And therefore it should be good because it's got my name on it, not because I'm trying to achieve some sort of class goal, you know? Um, but, you know, it took me whatever, uh, seven years of grad school to get to that point. Uh, and, um, and thus I've lived my entire public life. I, and I, and I do say this, you know, um, you can go back and read stuff that I wrote about gay marriage in 1999, you know, it's all out there. Right. And what has, oh, what has always guided me is, I, this idea that as long as what I'm advocating for is individual liberty and economic opportunity and American exceptionalism, that I'm not going to say or do anything crazy. Uh, um, but um, I don't think the average person approaches their 
public pronouncements like someone who's been writing in public for 20 years, <laughs> you know? Um, so uh, I, I do think there has been also another cultural shift over the last year and a half or so. And I think people are dialing back their social media presence. And it does seem like, yeah, there's, I mean, again, this is just anecdotal in my own life, but it does seem like the real wackos are, maybe are still pretty hardcore, but all my sort of normal friends are, have already learned this lesson. Like, oh, I, you know, I, I, I need to think about what I'm saying in public. Yeah. And so, um, in a way, it's that, that problem is almost solving itself as Americans are learning, how, I think, how to approach information from uh, social media sources. So this is just, I, I hope, I hope anyway, that that's something that's getting better. Fascinating. Um, Tony, uh, did you want to jump in here? We only got a couple minutes left. Yeah, I, I did want to like, uh, I, I wanted to talk about like the thing that, you know, in this peaceful transition of power and the things that kind of concerned me were the images from last year going, wow, this could really happen. And, uh, and then some of the stuff that's going on right now, you know, like uh, forged electors signatures being sent to, you know, and, and it feels like, uh, I guess my question is, has there been anything even like this, you know, in, in, our, in our history as a country? Uh, anything that comes close to it, right? Because I don't want to overblow it. And then, but the other part of it is just like my concern that 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 there's been some precedent set that this is just the way it's going to be. You know, like the next election will be a bigger attempt to do this, and then the next election, you know, and it may be from Democrats or Republicans. I don't know. You know, but that's, that's great, great question. I've got a follow up to that, Professor. Go ahead. Oh yeah, I would say that in most cases. Um... Uh, American elections, uh, you have, I guess uh, <laughs> every election in, involving black people was a gigantic fraud for a uh, 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 hundred years. <laughs> so um, in a way, we have always dealt with um, massive voter, or I shouldn't say always, but you know, I think when I think about what we would consider our first really fair election, um, I th the first election where uh, black people could vote in large numbers in 1968, 72, 76, 80 is really where, and so if you really wanna be kind of strict about it, like you say, well, we really only had what, even what I would call completely fair elections between, I mean, by its strictest definition for between 1980 and 2016, you know, and today. Uh, so, 36 years, yeah. Yeah, so in a way, I think that um, we lose sight of the fact that people have been using violence and the legal system in order to try to manipulate the American elections process for all of American history. Um, uh, well, let me ask a follow-up question, and even more dramatic, and I don't want to end with this, so somebody else has got to ask a better question. Uh, but Professor, the, the great, I don't know, great's not the right word, but the practical, the factual matter of being a conservative Republican elected official who served in the Army, I know uh, hundreds, if not thousands, if not tens of thousands of people that are gun owners and have experience in the guns. They just don't own some relics sitting there. I mean, they fire them and they use them. And, and knowing lots of people across the spectrum, I know a lot of violent people. Now, I'm not saying they beat their kids or their wife or their, uh, I'm not saying they're violent wantonly. I'm just saying they have the ability to, to use violence to accomplish their means. Um, and by the way, I'm not disparaging them. I like these people. They're my friends. I know them. They were my soldiers when I was a commander. They're my neighbors. January 6th was not an insurrection, although I call it an insurrection. I do believe it was an insurrection. 
it except for some weirdos and fringe elements though it was not rank and file americans who were ready to overthrow their government it, i i if they wanted to do it it would have been a totally it would have been not not hundreds of thousands it would have been millions of americans and i know everybody's scared that that actually might happen in coming years or decades to tony's point and for some damn odd reason, I'm more of an optimist. And maybe you've already addressed it the way you just did. But will you, I mean, let's address reality. Was January 6th an insurrection? And maybe a lousy one, but was it? And should we treat it as such? And then how do we, to Tony's point, avoid the real rank and file, God-loving, patriotic, gun-owning American who's so frustrated with their government that they're willing to go the Declaration of Independence versus the Constitution that they may have sworn as a, as a soldier? I know big question, but let's give a big answer. Okay. So the people, the, first, the first part is there were people within the Trump administration who were trying to overturn the results of the election. And there were people in the crowd that stormed the Capitol who were attempting to use violence in order to overturn the results of the election. It was an attempt using violence to overturn the results of an election. And those people who were trying to do that deserve all of the curses and maledictions we can pour upon them. <laughs> and that is why I stand beside, stand behind what I wrote then. However, and Liz Cheney and Ben Sass, and you're you're in that crowd of conservatives. Uh, certainly, yeah. Uh, but I would also say that most of the people who were gathered there to protest um, gathered there to protest the results of the election, and believed that the results of the election were the result of fraud, uh, and they were in error, but they were themselves. Um, not the originators of the error. <laughs> they were not the people who created this. They were not the ones who organized it. They were not the ones who were benefiting from it. Um, uh, they were um, uh, the people who were acting upon what these other people were doing. So to me, they belong in a different category. And they also deserve to be in a different category from people who were uh, vo voting for President Trump simply because they considered him the lesser of two evils. Uh, all very different groups of people to me. Uh, and I absolutely, um, uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's, that's what, um, um, that's how I've always, I guess, divided up the big buckets of, of who deserves our uh, ire. Full force of law on some, we're not sure on others, and grace on most. Well, I, I mean, I don't know. I, 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 grace, I suppose, but I, um, I, I, I believe in letting people be the best versions of themselves uh, and then letting them evolve into the best versions of themselves, if that's possible. Um, but I also uh, do believe that there are people who committed crimes and there are people who have been prosecuted for those crimes. And um, I, and there's a, I, I regret that the investigations have become politicized. Um, I understand that it is absolutely to the political advantage of Democrats to uh, keep Trump around forever. Uh, and, uh, but what I wish is that Republicans would realize that, um, I, I, that you, you, there's one thing that, uh, Trump supporters and Democrats agree with is that, that they want Trump to be around forever. Um, <laughs> that's insightful. Okay. Um, we're, we're getting within a couple minutes of your hard stop. Uh, Frank, second bite of the apple, Bart and Tony. Here's a chance to weigh in or should we just declare victory? Bart. Yeah. Frank wants to declare victory. Let's just mm -hmm. declare yeah. victory. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, right. Wait, wait, that's different. Uh, yeah. There's a couple of different symbols of that, but that's okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're okay, Bart? You're okay, Frank? Uh, Tony, you okay? 
Well, let me ask the last big question then. Um, have we done justice to this conversation, Professor? I, I know I did it the way I wanted to do it because I think we're mistaking by demonizing the other. We're, we're Americans and we're just making a huge strategic mistake by hating 45% of the population. So I, I did it the way I wanna do it intentionally. I have very firm opinions on this and I wrote a lot on it myself and I'm not shy, but I don't think I wanna be talking about this every damn day. I want Congress to do their role as an oversight. I want the next political system. I want the, the, sec I want the media to do their job. I want us as citizens to do our job, but I just, I'm not an elected official. I'm not a Congressman. I'm not a governor. I'm a friend of yours and we do these interviews once a week, but that, that doesn't mean it's like my role to make sure Trump is, you know, sent to Mar-a-Lago and has to stay there or something. I, you know, I, have I done this justice or no? Um, no, we really should be talking about how evil this day was and how we have to write new laws. Uh, you know, I don't know if, if, from your perspective, have we done this justice? I think that I've done it justice insofar as my limited area of expertise would go. You know, I, I would say that if I were an expert in many other areas, that then I that you should ask me about those things. But, you know, like I'm not an expert in everything. I, I think it would be interesting. I find it interesting to listen to conversations where prosecutors and constitutional law professors uh you know, sort of th think through the issues of the prosecution and all that. But, you know, that's so far beyond my expertise that I shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> you know, uh, there's, there are a lot of, uh, mo I don't, there, most things I don't know. I, I, yeah. So. Yeah. Frank, I'm giving you a bite at the apple. You took yourself off mute. What do you want to say in context of this? Was this helpful or talk about whatever you want to talk about for two minutes or less? You know that, uh, uh, no, I don't have anything else to say. This is good. I'm happy. Okay. Okay. Tony, you good? Bart, I'm telling you, watch some of my private posts. I've got some friends that are just so damn angry. And this is across the political spectrum. Mm -hmm. Tony, you know a couple of them, man. I, I've had to defend a couple of liberals. I've had to defend a couple of conservatives. I mean, I don't want to know their opinion. They are mean-spirited personally against me because I'm not stopping Trump or I'm not helping Trump. I'm just like, just well, ah, gosh, I want to go for a hike. Um, the, only thing, the only thing I see you do is uh, talk about what a beautiful day it is and what a great run it was. Thank you. Um, and that's what I want to talk about. Let's all go hiking. Let's be, let's live life. Um, yeah, I'm glad you've ignored some of my political posts, Frank. Otherwise, you'd be one of the haters out there. Anyway, um, just professor. Real liberals and real conservatives have, should have nothing to fear from these conversations. Like, you know, I feel like these are, we're defending real liberals and real conservatives. Um, That's a good way to end. Uh, professor, thank you for your, uh, how much pay have you gotten in the year that we've been doing this? We've gotten like 40 of these shows. How, how much pay? Uh, that would be $0. Tony, how much have you sent me? You're our producer. Uh, $0. How much and how much have you gotten out of the profit of the professor and I since you're our producer? Zero, but a lot of great knowledge. That has no, has no uh, audience money. members, uh, friends, Bart and Frank, you've gotten paid? No, no pay. Yeah. Great, no monetary <laughs> compensation. But I will say the academic um, knowledge that I have obtained is incredible. I mean, I've read three or four books that the professor has recommended. I'm reading one of them right now that he didn't recommend, but I bet he would. Which I'm way, reading which Suicide of the West by Joe. Oh, yeah. Yep, mm -hmm. it's excellent. Uh, which is I like fantastic. That book also. In fact, I referenced something that he said about that book. Um, he said that book is intellectually baggy. And I, and I love that <laughs> definition of it because at each point of the book, you kind of have to buy the premise and then move on to the next point in order to allow the thought experiment to continue. But I, I do. I love that book. Yeah. OK. Yeah, I, I think it's totally amazing for a, yeah. a person who's not a professional historian. You know, he's he's really a pundit. Um, well, but he just puts so much knowledge into that book. It's incredible. Well, yeah. Bart, we're going to increase your bonuses for such a nice compliment to us. Um, so. <laughs> Thank you all for being good citizens. We're not going to have a, a review after this because the professor's got to get on his way. Um, thank you for your time.